But I wanted to just give a couple of announcements before we started uh, because we want to be right on time and there was some concern that we were eating into, well, we're just going to do announcements right now. So um, keep eating if you want and get a cookie. Uh, just so you know, we have revised the table of contents and that is by design. So um, there was some confusion about it. Look at the study syllabus revised and that is what you want to look at, study syllabus revised. And the only reason we've done that is because we thought it was going to be perfect to have 16 weeks for a 16 chapter book. But the problem is the first chunk is 10 weeks and we didn't want to leave you um, over Advent and Christmas halfway through Romans 9, 10 and 11 because that is quite heavy weather, uh, we should say. And um, well, anyway, we want to leave you at the end of this this section with the wonderful um, statement, what then could separate us from the love of God in Christ? Can famine or shipwreck or the sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who gave himself for us and laid down his life for us. So we're going to leave you with that. So, and we're also going to have at the very end a uh, recap slash question and answer day. So if over the next course of the, the study, things do, do not become clear, which seems very unlikely, but nevertheless could be the case, um, then please uh, submit your questions. You can email me directly as always, but you can also just tell your leader and we will uh, address them on the final, um, the final uh, uh, time together, which will be on um, November 15th. And so that will be uh, a time for us to uh, go back over the grand themes that we have covered and to make sure that you have, at the very least, the key points of the various chapters, Romans 1 through 8. Also, this is just the announcement time, we are going to put in another order for the little ESV uh, reader um, note-taking uh, Romans books. Some of you may have seen people are carrying them around. Does someone have one? They want to raise it and show people what they're looking at? Yes, these things. Uh, we're going to place another order. They're $7, and if you would like one, they will be available this time next week. Um, I believe that is all of the uh, specific announcements that we have, and it's right before six when we'll start so we have just enough time to sing happy birthday so kelly happy birthday mike mitchell it's actually their day we wouldn't do it if it was like this month because that was also uh, but it is today right so let's sing happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday dear mike and kelly <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Yay. All right, so get your uh, drinks. This is, um, we're going to begin. We, um, we're going to start by praying, and then we're going to get right into our study. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Blessed Lord who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, well, welcome again. Some of you have just been able to join us this week, which is great. And if you um, would like to catch up or haven't already, then the um, uh, uh, lectures or the, the teachings are all on YouTube. Uh, so we are engaging here, as I will say in the beginning of each of the um, uh, classes, in what I, um, I don't think I coined this, uh, but, but I use it a lot and I have for many years now, what we call doxological theology. And that's simply meaning that it is a, it's a position and a posture of, of reverence and prayerful gratitude to the Lord when we study his word and when we learn more about who he is. So this is not an academic endeavor, although we will use our minds. And it's not purely a, as it were, sort of emotive or spiritual endeavor, although I hope that your hearts are, in the words of John Wesley, strangely warmed at times by the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. But it is, in fact, a combination of the two. Is we want to be a, what the um, theologians call a psychosemitic unity, right? You know, the, the argument about 
You'll often hear people say the longest distance in the human body is the 12 inches from the head to the heart. You know, you've heard that said. And what is often the implication? That what is in your heart is true over against what your head is telling you? Or, um, because you very rarely hear someone say, well, what I think is true and what I feel is wrong. Well, we reject both of those dichotomies and say that actually the, the locus of the human person is in the combination of the head and heart. We worship God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Right, and so we are um, we are engaging in theology. You're here learning about the Lord through His Word, but it is to the end of deepening your devotion and reverence and awe of His mighty power. That's the goal, okay? Because I know we've talked. I was just talking with someone about this recently. That um, you know the the 20th century will go down, or the 19th and 20th century in at least. Uh, Western Christian theology as an incredible um, time of divorcing the actual practice of ministry, i.e. Um, pastoral ministry, you know, baptize, marry, and bury, you know, hatch, match, and dispatch, you know, that's what the British say, you know, they have detached the actual work of dealing with people, which can be quite messy, um, from theology, which can be quite pristine if you do it, you know, sort of by yourself in the proverbial ivory tower. And what that has resulted in is a very anemic church because the pastors have not been sufficiently trained to actually exposit the scriptures because they aren't quote unquote professionals and the professionals haven't been adequately chastened by having to deal with real human beings on a daily basis. And so we see we get the state of the church that we're in now. Well, there's a whole generation of us that have, uh, are observing the sort of failures of what has come before us, and we are in the process of resetting that. And so that's what we're doing here, because the Bible is, is um, it's rich, and it's, it's lengthy, and there are many different genres, and it does require some study, but it is not impenetrable. And it was never intended to be obtuse or obscure, and it was in fact given as a gift from God through the inspiration of his Holy Spirit to his church so that they would have the sufficient knowledge to, to hold them fast in the middle of the trials and temptations and sufferings of this life. And so that's why you, I mean, I'm a broken record, you know, but this is what, this is why we're doing all this, this doxological theology. And so as we say all the time, that Paul is simply explicating what Jesus told explicitly was the purpose of the scriptures to, to reveal and to explain why he had to be crucified and raised. He said this himself, remember? He said, in beginning with Moses and the prophet, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so that's all we're continuing to do is work our lives and our faith and our understanding of the Bible through the lens which has been purchased at great cost by Jesus himself for us, namely his death and resurrection for sinners. Okay? Well, that's my story, and we'll stick to it um, from here on out. So, the, but I hope you see this, um, and I, if I sound a little defensive, I'm slightly defensive. I was more defensive when I began this, and now after years of having seen it put in practice, I'm less defensive because um, the number of people that I could point to by name is many more toes than, than I have toes and fingers who say things like, I never um, understood the Bible until, you know, uh, this class or those sermons or this, and what, not just me, I mean, other faithful expositors, and it was heartbreaking. Now, you have had a long history of, of wonderful exegetical preaching, so y'all are a little bit of an outlier, and, and, you, and we bear the fruit here of that. But there are many people who spend their lives in church who are afraid of opening their Bibles because they're afraid of, of uh, you know, or they just turn to like a couple of verses, you know, like the Jeremiah, um, you know, I know the plans I have for you, or Romans 8, 28. And these are wonderful verses. But this is, we're, we're getting beyond that, um, just those snippets. Because when we let this settle in on us, then it can't help but do what God has promised it would, which is feed his sheep. And so, okay. Let's get back into Romans. So we are at the turning point. Remember I told you we're going to get down into the ditch before he pulls us up. Well, we're not going to be fully pulled out of the ditch tonight, but we are making the turn, right? We are finally, it's like when the, I'm not a pilot, but I've watched enough movies where, you know, you're pulling on the yoke and you're just watching the mountain come right at you, you know, and it's like right at the last minute, you know, or like the wrestler, you know, it's like one, two, and then his arms held up. Well, this is, we're getting there tonight, but not just yet, because we have to get all the way in, 
all the way into the depths of our need in order to begin to, I don't want to say fully, there's no way of fully appreciating the glory of the majesty of God and Christ for sinners, but we will begin to have that even deepened in our lives the more we understand the depths of our need and sin before him. Okay, so remember Romans chapter 1. I'm just going to do a brief overcap here before we get into 3. I would always like to put it into context. This was the thesis of the whole book, the whole letter. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That is the thesis statement. I will argue, and Paul will argue, not simply of Romans, but of the entire Bible. The entire Bible was intended to uh, answer and address the problem of, of, of sin into the world, namely unbelief, we're going to talk about that, and the rectification of unbelief is not to work harder, but to believe in, the God, believe in God rightly, is to confess, yes, God did really say. You remember in the garden, the question, the argument was, did God really say you should not touch of this? You know, and the answer essentially was, maybe, probably not. You know, I'm not sure he really said much of anything. Right? And this was the entrance of sin into the world. The results of that sin look like, Paul would call, the work of the flesh. All the, all the attitudes of unbelief. You know, when you, have a, when you make a, a commitment um, and you begin to waver in your commitment, when you stop to believe whether you should have done it in the first place or not, well then, that's when you begin to transgress your previous commitment. You know, when you, when you say, did God really say that he, um, that he uh, called me to this holy matrimony, you know, for instance? Did God really say that I shouldn't, um, that uh, unequal weights and measures, you know, sort of uh, cheating on my taxes was an abomination to him? You know, maybe. I mean, surely he couldn't have meant this, right? I mean, they're doing it. They're getting away. Don't they do it too? And so on and so forth. That the, when unbelief enters the human heart, as we're going to see, then we go astray. So the rectification of unbelief was for Jesus to put into the world, not just into your heart, but into time and space, an anchor that could be unassailable faith, uh, like a faith anchor, for lack of a better word, right? This is where we look back to and we say, that is where God revealed our need and his love for us on that day, in that person, for me, and that's the message we take to the world. So, we know that when he was talking about the result of unbelief, I, namely worshiping the creature rather than the creator, well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like doing whatever you want, right? And it looks like giving yourself over to, your, to the lusts of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life, as, Jade, as 1 John says, right? It looks like um, exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And so it's not limited in any way to any of the sort of possible depravities you could imagine. You know, elevating yourself at the expense of everyone else has disastrous consequences, and yet there is a sense in which it is our primal or sort of um, our, our fundamental sort of drug of choice. You know, people uh, really enjoy having other people worship them, and people really enjoy um, sacrificing anything they can to get what they really want. This is the result and fruit of sin. Now, you remember when Paul was talking about this, he had two people in mind. He had the Jewish people who had come to faith in Christ, the Messiah, who would have had a um, long history of uh, sort of confusion and sort of well, probably outright uh, revulsion in some ways to the, to the excesses of the pagan lifestyle, right? To, to their debauchery, to the way that they had all these gods, the way that they didn't have any sexual ethics. They didn't have, you know, going down the list. And Paul, so Paul has those people in mind as well as the Gentiles who were newly converted to Christ, which would have been quite a dramatic conversion. We've talked about before, and if you don't, we'll talk more about it in the rector's form, but we suffice it to say it was a 180 degree turn for many of these pagans. You know, as I say often, when all of a sudden, you know, you had a, a believing husband and wife and then the total um, sexual mores, which up until then had been, um, you know, particularly for men, uh, you uh, can do whatever you want with whomever you want as long as it's not someone who's above you in the social strata. All of a sudden, when they get saved, they start saying, you know, forsaking all others with this woman till death do we part. You know, that's quite a change. 
And I was just listening to a sociologist, a Christian sociologist, talk about this. That they were saying, you know, the reason why women, in particular, have always have always been, um, if not the outright majority, at least a large proportion of the of the church from the first century on, was that it was an, it radically elevated the worth and dignity of of women, in particular, to equal status with men. You know, this is what we had uh, the image of God. He created them, not male or female, but male and female. And so, you know, with all, when we see non-Christian cultures, we see um, infanticide at an incredibly high rate, particularly of young girls. You know, we see, um, anyway, I'm getting it offside. But the point is, the Jews would have been hearing Paul and reading, this would have been read out loud to them, and would have been like, uh-huh, that's right, that's what those people did, you know? Like, they, they, I'm glad they're here, I guess, but like, don't sit next to me necessarily, right? And then Paul turns to the other ones and said, um, not so fast. Right? Why don't we recap all of Romans 2? But not so fast, you Jewish people, you know, because you are also, have, you have the law, and yet you are just as unrighteous and just as in need of the saving grace through faith as these Gentiles. And so Paul, if we want to go back over last week, explicates that uh, entirely. But uh, he ends with this in Romans chapter 2. For circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and the circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now let's stop right here just for a second. You know, Paul is simply teaching what Jesus, um, sort of this radical interiority that Jesus brought through his teaching and preaching to the world. You remember there's a famous incident where Jesus' uh, followers, his disciples, are not following the ritual cleansing laws in order to uh, be ritually pure before they ate. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling about this transgression of the law. You know, it had been a law, like in order to show your, your righteousness, you had to you know, ritually purify yourself in order to, to eat, and you certainly couldn't eat with tax collectors and sinners. And what does Jesus famously say? It's not the, what goes into you that makes you unclean, but what comes out of your heart is what defiles you. What comes out of your heart is evil, slander, maliciousness, um, envy, jealousy, um, licentiousness. Like this, this is what makes you unclean. To which the question is, well, how can one change your heart? You know, this is the question. And he would, and then, you know, similarly speaking, Jesus talks about sin in, in equally impossibly to fulfill ways. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, right? If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Well, as we were talking about the leaders meeting beforehand, if you told, if, if we were given, the, the scripture said, um, if you could, if that would work, right? If, if you could avoid eternal damnation by plucking your eye out, like we'd find a pretty quick way to get that done. At least I would, right? But that's not the problem. The problem is your heart. And if you pluck your heart out, what happens when you die? Well, someone did have to die. The whole point is they're cutting off all avenues but Christ. And so Paul is even looking at circumcision and saying, listen, even circumcision itself, which we're going to hear at the end, um, he's going to revisit this at the end of chapter 3, circumcision was a gift and a, and a, 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 a sign, but even through that, it was by faith. This is the confusion. Like, even through that, you, you know, the people who were circumcised and the people who weren't circumcised, it is all on account of faith, and now faith revealed in and through Jesus Christ for sinners. So he presupposes the arguments, though. And we're not going to deal in depth with this because the, um, we've got more to get to, but, but we'll look at it briefly. In the beginning of chapter 3, Paul has a wonderful way of anticipating his objectors, right? He's writing this letter to this church, and he knows who he's writing to, and he knows that, you know, Frankie, the, the smart aleck over there, is going gonna, is gonna, to, he's going to bring these up, and he knows that, you know, that, um, you know, Susie over there um, is just sitting in the back, you know, sort of shaking her head or whatever, and so he, he knows these people, and he loves them, you know, but he also wants to compensate for their objections, and he's been hearing things, right? People have been talking. Those people say, you know, those people have all sorts of things to say all the time in every church, right? So those people, um, so he hears these people, and what does he say? 
He says, then what advantage is the Jew? That's the first question. You just came at circumcision, Paul, so what's the big deal? What advantage does the Jew have? He says, well, uh, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So let's just start with the fact that you were chosen out of, out of all people to bear the truth about God to the world. You know, you were not supposed to worship the moon thinking that it was divine. You were not supposed to wonder whether the rain would come if you sacrificed babies. Like You were the one who were given the oracles and said, well, then what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means, he says. Meganoito, it's this wonderful Greek phrase that he uses in, throughout his letters. He means like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Is that a real question? That's what he's asking, right? Um, by no means, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So, the fact that some were unfaithful does not in any way impunge, impugn the faithfulness of God. But, you might say, if our unrighteousness serves to show how the righteousness of God what should we then say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? To see what someone's arguing? They're saying the same idea that he says in Galatians. Should we sin so that grace could abound? If God's faithfulness to me actually makes his faithfulness in light of my unfaithfulness that much more glorifying, well, shouldn't we just perpetuate our unfaithfulness? Or shouldn't he not punish us for that because he's cutting off his nose despite his face, in other words. You know, if his faithfulness in your persistent sin is glory, well then, you should keep on sinning, or he shouldn't punish us. And Paul again says, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? Are you, are you kidding? Absolutely not. I mean, there's more to all of this, but suffice it to say, he's just bringing up the, um, the, uh, the objections. Uh, because if that were true, then your unrighteousness could not be justly judged. But it is justly judged because God is a God of justice. So he said, by no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth abounds to his glory, why am I being still, uh, still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some may, people slanderously charge us with saying, well, their condemnation is just. And so he's just walking through these objections, getting to the point of the matter. But suffice it to say that the argument that is, uh, uh, comes with the gospel is, like Kelly was preaching on uh, Sunday, um, is that there's a lack of fairness at its heart. How is this fair? How is this true? How is this possible? And Paul is going to lay this out. And there are people then, as now, who hear this and say, wait, 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 that's, that's either too good to be true, or, you know, really, I seriously cannot be on the same level as those people over there, or that person in history. Um, give me a break. Like, that surely cannot be the case. And yet Paul is walking through saying, just wait, because we're about to get to the final, the final diagnosis before, you know, the, 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 um, the uh, um, mountain is about, we're about to hit it, right? <laughs> and then we're going to pull up, but we're still, we're still tracking downwards. Um, I just keep having, uh, like, fly to the navigator in my head, uh, which is, um, what's her name? Sarah Jessica Par Parker's fa best movie, the Fly to the Navigator. And we're good. Anyway, so... Um, I was going to meet her one time, I think I told you, and uh, I was all prepared to say that. I was like, my favorite two movies, Mrs. Parker, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Parker, is um, L.A. Story and Flight of the Navigator. <laughs> and this, um, um, anyway, that, I thought that was going to endear me to her. So, uh, maybe not. So he says this, What then, are we Jews better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged it all. And this is the whole point of this. All, you, the people arguing with us, those people talking, those, the people just coming in from, from you know, pagan worship, those people who have been of the tribe of Benjamin, like Paul himself, all, all, uh, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. So this is the big, this is the final statement, that you are under sin, in the state of sin. You have been given over, but before Christ, to the reality of sin and death, as he'll call later the law of sin and death. And so, what are the effects of these laws? Well, he talks about um, right here, none is righteous, this is from Psalm 14, 1, 3, no, not one. So, the very first thing that he goes through here is the legal, so we're going through the long list of the effects of sins. If you're looking at your study guide, this is, this is question number two. This is the long list of the effects of sin. The very first one is that no one is righteous. That means no one. That's, a, that's, 
That's an in all-inclusive, encompassing statement. So you mean Mother Teresa and um, you know the uh, Jeffrey Dahmer were on the same moral standing before God? And the answer, radically and with incredible um, sort of uh, sort of echoes of shock and horror around the world, is yes. No one is righteous. No, not one. So um, no one understands. This is what we would call the, the noetic effects of sin, theologians say. The, the fact that we have had our mental capabilities have been altered on account of sin. We no longer think about ourselves or God rightly. We have bought into the lie, and we worship created things as if they were divine. You know, we actually want more money than we want fellowship with God. You know, we actually want um, you know, sex and power more than we want to lay down our lives for our friends, and so on and so forth. That is not simply a decision. That is a result, a state of sinful reality. No one seeks, uh, understands. No one seeks for God. You know, all these people that are looking for God in all the wrong places, you know, to quote um, whatever that old song is, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places, they're not actually looking for God. They're looking for something that they want to be God, which Paul says is something that is a projection of their own selfish, sinful desires. You know, I, I would go to church um, if God could, you know, could have, um, you know, promised me um, health, wealth, and, and, uh, and beauty or something, you know, and that actually preaches. I mean, there are churches, sadly, that are suffused with that heresy. We call it the health wealth gospel. And they say, if you come, if you sow money into my ministry, well, then God will sow money back into your ventures which is just another form of sort of ancient pagan mythology, and yet that is much more attractive to many than come here to our church and learn how to die with faith and joy. You know, now, yay, you know, that's, that, doesn't sound, that doesn't sound so fun, you know, but it's like, well, we've already been promised it's coming, so we might as well, you know, get our heads around it on the front end, and then we'll figure out what it looks like as we walk the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years together, right? I, mean, I have a, a friend of mine who said, uh, I don't know if I mentioned in this context, but it bears repeating. He said, you know, I spent, he's an older man, and he is in ministry, and he said, I spent the first 20 years of my life trying to minimize the differences between the world and the church. We're just as cool as they are. You know, we've got, we got just as good of music. Like, our coffee's just as good. You know, I'm just as hip, all these things. And he's like, and I finally gave up, and now I say, listen, if you come to our church, everything's going to have to change. <laughs> so, um, you know, just... You might as well know that from the onset, you know, slam the door right in front of me. You're like, all right, next door. <laughs> Here we go. Um, because that's, that's the stakes of the matter, right? That Jesus came not to teach us, but to, in, um, to, uh, to, to go into the flesh, as we're going to hear, through his blood, for our blood, for our sake, so that we would then be given the life of faith, which would make all the difference. And again, we're going to hear all this. I said to the leaders earlier, you stick with us here. Because what Paul is doing in 1, 2, and 3 is sort of laying out the, the, the kernel form of what he will spend the rest of the book unpacking. So we're going to revisit all these issues. We're going to talk about baptism and circumcision again. We're going to talk about Abraham again. We're going to talk about the law and sin and death again. We're going to talk about um, uh, you know, the, the hope of resurrection, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about all this again. But he's, he's like a good, you know, a good preacher, but also like a good storyteller. You know, you have the, you're going to come back to this, like, oh, we've heard this. We just like the, the um, you know, like the overture. So just so stick with us. So no one seeks for God. <clears throat> All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So there's a corporate aspect to sin. There's an individual aspect to sin that drives you to sort of your own want and desire. And then we together like to get together and sin as people. You know, we are, as Isaiah says, a people of unclean lips amongst people of unclean hands. You know, we like to, um, we, and you see this sort of in mass social psychosis all throughout human history. You know, we, we get riled up about all sorts of things, and we get murderous, and we get, um, well, we evince our sinful natures, corporately and individually. And he says, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. We speak wrongly on account of sin. You know, we're hateful and malicious and cruel and bitter and backbiting. You know, I mean, just don't, if you don't believe me, well, you have to believe me if you're a human being. That's not a, and it doesn't mean we are, we are left to that, the only way that we communicate, but the capacity and the ability and the prevalence of it is a mark of recorded human history for as long as we have. We know this to be the case. 
And again, we are just getting the diagnosis here. You know, we're in church, we're strumbling, we're sweating a little bit, you know, but, but the good news is coming, but, but this is not yet. And their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Excuse me. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. Well, again, Paul is just stringing together as he can um, these wonderful quotations from the Old Testament, which you could go back, if you'd like, and unpack in the context and see just even how much more richer they are if you, if you understood that Paul is picking out particular phrases that can be unpacked within the context of their uh, writing for even deeper and more um, sort of damning critique of the people about whom he's speaking, namely you and me and his congregants there in Rome. And then the final statement, the final recourse of sin, and actually the most, the most um, jarring for the life of a believer is there is no fear of God before their eyes. You know, this is, this is the, it's hard to even talk about, um, it, it, from a Christian perspective, of the various and manifold ways that unbelieving people mock and show their contempt and scorn for a God that they have no fear of. You know, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you know, you can just go down through um, history. I mean, even, even some of the earliest um, artwork we have, there's a famous um, drawing of a, uh, a picture of a donkey on a cross, and it's, and it's a, a Greek man, I forget the Greek, but it's Alexios. Do you know this picture? And it says, Alexios worships his God. This is like one of the, like the second century drawing. I mean, this is what has been contemptible and mockable about the Christian faith in particular is that we worship a crucified and risen Lord, which is a, which is a laughingstock, or as Paul says, a stumbling block to the Jews. You know, they're kind of like, well, that's not exactly how we, we expected it to come. I mean, I'm, I'm, but I'll listen a little longer. But for the Jews, it was foolishness. Just that was outright lunacy. You know, the foolishness with what we preach, he says, um, to the church in Corinth. That is the power of God into salvation. And so when we look at the actual uh, realities of, of unbelief, we see the lack of fear of God Almighty. And that is something that, is, that, that can make one tremble if we do have fear of God. But we certainly look around and see that that is in, on clear evidence all around us and down throughout history. So he continues... Now we know that whatever our uh, law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now I told the leaders here earlier today, if you all don't get anything else out of this, um, that this verse at the end, the purpose of the law It's not the only purpose, but the primary use of the law is into the world was to reveal sin. It was not to teach you primarily what to do. It was to show you what you aren't doing and where you need to go, or at least put you on the search for somebody to uh, forgive you for your trespasses and sins. And we know this is a fact. And when the law was given, even back in, um, to Moses, the very first thing that had to be instituted right after the giving of the law was what? The sacrificial system. Because once you knew what you would, were supposed to do, you looked down and realized you weren't doing it, particularly from the heart, and you begin to cry out rightly, or the people did, well, who then can be saved? How can we be given um, atonement for our sins? And the joy of that, though, is that we talked about last week, we actually know where sins can be forgiven. I mean, that's the joy of it. You know, we have analogously people walking around evincing the life of wanton sin, darkened minds, rebellious hearts, sensuous passions, and accruing the weight of what that would look like, broken relationships, guilt and fear before God, a sense of alienation and desperation, and not knowing where they could go to lay their burdens down. We have been given both the diagnosis and the means of grace. That is the joy. That's why I talk about all the time. You know, we have this dramatically converse, sort of even seemingly perverse to an unbelieving world, um, joyful proclamation of our sins in the sense that we know we can lay them down and they can be forgiven. That's an amazing gift that God instituted all the way back when, with Moses and as we're going to hear, forwent the actual outpouring of his wrath on those sins because bulls and goats were never actually going to atone for the sins of humans and be- human beings. 
but the one imperfect human who was finally uh, came in the flesh, he was the one who through his blood would bring that promised final forgiveness. So, by the works of the law, no human will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, there's more to be said about the law, and we're going to talk the whole rest of the book is, is in, in a part, sort of an explication of how do we fully understand the law. But suffice it to say, at its instance, at its, at its first and primary use, it is to bring you to your knees. And that's why we preach it to its highest pitch. You know, when Jesus, I mean, Kelly was preaching it wonderfully on this Sunday, and just read through the Sermon on the Mount. And if that, if you believe Jesus is, is uh, which, you know, that's a whole other, that's the gift of faith, then you start to wonder, well, who could possibly fulfill all of these demands? And you're like, well, one person we've heard of has, um, and he's our Lord. He reigns on high, and he's coming again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Would you like to hear more about him? Come to church, you know, we'll talk about, we talk about him all the time. So, for the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, there's a lot of questions in here about, um, about the uh, sort of effects of sin and the power of sin, and so I want you all can have a discussion about that, but we've got to keep moving um, forward. But suffice it to say... We're not trying to argue that every human being is equally um, sort of, uh, that their sins are of equal sort of uh, deplorable nature. There are people who are objectively speaking doing worse things than others. There is something called common grace, which we can be grateful for, that actually restrains the wanton, um, you know, sort of um, psychopathic desires of most people. You know, we're grateful for that. Most people are not just murdering whoever they want. Most people, many people who get married stay married, whether they're Christians or not. You know, many people don't just walk into stores and steal stuff, you know, so we're grateful for that. But that's not Paul's point. Paul's point is not that, um, that there are some people that are better or worse at sinning than others. His fundamental point is that before God's holy righteous demand, there is nothing but equality among the sinners because the mouths have to be stopped. Because your sense of self-righteousness and your sense of uh, pretension before a holy God over against even the the, the worst people you know has to be eradicated for you to understand rightly what is truly at stake and what the cost was that Jesus paid for you. That's what Paul's point is. Because once we are killed by the law, as he'll say in Romans 6, once you have been crucified and buried with Christ, well, then you no longer live to sin in the same way. We'll talk about that when we get there. But suffice it to say, he has all sorts of ideas about how your life will now live. But it has to be lived from this foundation. Because as we were talking about in the leaders' meeting, this is the foundation that actually will begin to eradicate the, what he'll call in Ephesians the dividing wall of hostility. You know, this is the one that brings down the, the fear of the, of the battle of the sexes. You know, when you actually believe that your, your wife is just as much of a sinner as you are, right? And that's a hard thing to believe. Oh, but, um, but, you know, you believe that your children are just as sinful as, as, as uh, anyone else. You begin to pray for them in different ways. You begin to, to shepherd them in different ways. And you begin to understand them in different ways, and so on and so forth. That is the foundation that will begin to actually build the body of Christ on earth, where we have people coming from all different walks of life and different, different um, experiences and different expectations and different um, ethnicities and tribes and languages and tongues, and we actually have a shot because it's been purchased for us to grow into one body together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But this is the foundation. This is why Paul belabors it so much, because um, every mouth will be stopped except in praise to Jesus, and that can look and take a variety of different forms and will, in fact, all the way into the marriage feast of the Lamb. But now, he says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Remember, just echoing Jesus' teaching um, that Paul would, would, is explicating. Um, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. 
Well, there you have it. We've been talking the entire time about the law and its exposure of the unrighteousness of both the Jew and the Gentile, of the entire world. And we have the final statement here. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now, you all know, if you come on Sundays, this word propitiation. It's a wonderful word. Hilasterion is a Greek. And many modern translations, wrongly, don't translate it this way because they're afraid of what it actually means. And what it means is there is a righteous wrath that was um, directed towards you that has now been taken away by Jesus. That his, God's wrath has been propitiated on your behalf. Now, there are other aspects. There's a semantic domain to the word, to be sure, but all of them have to do with just punishment being, being um, sort of furloughed or, or put on to Jesus as opposed to those who have faith in him. You know, his, his, as we were talking about before, both the consequences of his, his active righteousness you know, uh, his, his, the, the, the benefits of that, and him taking on our unrighteousness. Both sides of this coin have been, have been given to you by faith, and the wrath of God has been propitiated on the cross for sin. So God put him forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, we're getting real sort of, this is deep level cuts here. How can God be the just and the justifier? Where would we have gotten that idea? Well, if you came to Galatians, you, would, you might remember, but I'll refresh you if you didn't. You go all the way back to Genesis 15, which was right, right here, and we have God's covenant with Abram, right? Well, God, at the very end, um, said, look towards the heaven, number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall our offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to him his righteousness. Now you're going to hear more about Abraham next week in Kelly's teaching, but, but this is where he can be just and justified. So in a covenant ratification ceremony back in the day, uh, in order, you know, we didn't have a lot of lawyers, or they had lawyers, but we didn't have, you know, we, we needed to keep this clean and simple. So you and I make a decision, a covenant, and in order to make sure that you keep up, you're in the bargain and I do, we bring out some animals, right? And we chop them up. <laughs> and we get as bloody as possible, and we stick them on the ground, and then you and I hold hands, like do -si do and we walk through the entrails of the animal in order to show what will happen to one side of the agreement if you let down your bargain. I mean, can you imagine, um, you know, there weren't as many used car salesmen back in the day, you know, like I'm sure we talked about Tom. Well, what does God do with Abram during this covenant? He does cut the covenant, but he puts Abraham to sleep. And he symbolically walks through as both sides of the covenant, both the just and the justifier. Because he knew that one of the two parties in this covenant, i.e. man and himself, God, was not going to be up to the task, was not faithful, would in fact betray, and were in fact sinners. And yet he made provision back, well, all the way back in the garden when he promised that the seed of, of Eve would crush the serpent's heel, but the working out of that plan of redemption went through the people of Abram, his covenant people, so that when he himself in his son took on the, the ramifications of that broken covenant that hearkened back to the promise that he made to Abraham, he could be both the just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. I mean, can you imagine, like Paul, even writing that, he must have been weeping. You know, like, this is what this meant? This is how this came to be? You know, Lord have mercy. And he has. That's, that's what we're looking at with um, the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So then we'll conclude here. Well, then what becomes of our boasting, right? He's asking, so what are we supposed to talk about now, right? Like, I mean, I, isn't it good for me to, to be, you know, on the vestry? You know, it is good. Just say, you know, like, isn't it good? Well, sure, but it's excluded. It's excluded by what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Because you now know that despite the good works that you are performing, that it is all by grace and nothing except on account of faith. 
and that God has shown his mercy even to you. And so the works that you now do are counted and sort of appreciated in an entirely different way than they ever could be would you not, had you not have come to faith in the Lord Jesus for your sins. You know, this is, this is the pernicious, as Kelly was preaching about, the perniciousness of not our bad works. You know, we know that those are bad. It's that we're, we're not aware of the fact that we actually get very comfortable with our good works. You know, it's, 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 it's as hard to, um, to evangelize a good person. It's actually in many ways more difficult. You know, like, I'm good. You know, I know, I know how you were in college, so I know, understand why you're in, you're in church. You know, that's kind of what, sort of, uh, you know, but, but I mean, I was on the, I was Phi Beta Kappa, like you were not, um, you know, so yeah, I get it. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a reality then as now. But he says, no, but by the law of faith, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow this law by faith, the law by this faith? By no means, again, neganoito, on the contrary, we uphold the law. Okay, well, in our last couple of minutes here, I want to touch these two points. So the discussion about the uncircumcised, the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, again, brings us full circle back to the gift of circumcision. Like, what was the big point, right? Well, he points out then and reiterates here now that the point of circumcision was never in and of itself. It was always a mark of the covenant which was appropriated by faith. You remember, after Abraham was inaugurated in the covenant, then he has the circumcision done as a sign of the promise that had been inaugurated and believed and counted righteous by faith alone. That's what Paul is pointing out. Now, he might not have really, uh, well, one imagines he, well, he didn't understand that until it was made clear to him by the Holy Spirit. But, um, but that was the radical statement to the Jew. And then also to the uncircumcised, it was always, since it was on, on account of faith, um, the same essential position before God. Namely, you could think about, i um, thinking about the thief on the cross, but there were a number of other uh, people who, uh, you know, he must have had in mind who had come to faith and were not circumcised and were therefore nevertheless still counted just as righteous on account of faith through Christ um, as the person who had been. So he's just saying, you know, this is a tough thing for you to swallow. For generations, you Jewish people, you have been counting on this action as the mark of the covenant, and I'm here to tell you that it's an important act, but it was always in service of signifying the real heart of the matter, which was faith and trust in God. And you pagan over there, well, we can, we can just start about your whole life's been upended. You know, like, hang, hang in there, buddy. Um, but, you know, hang, y'all hang out together, right? This is, what we're, this is what we're observing. And then finally here, this is the second important part of this. Do we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. Well, what does that mean? Well, I've likened it in the past to this is an analogy that helps or description. Let's say we didn't have any stop signs or um, we didn't have any speed limits or we didn't have any uh, uh, bottles with uh, poison markers on them, except by faith through the revelation of God, we actually were able to see some of these things, right? Well, we would be given by faith to uphold some of those things which were for our good, even though there were people around us who were like, you're just believing in fairy tales. You're not, you know, there's no stop sign there. There's no speed limit there. There's no reason to limit yourself in this way. There's no reason to, to, uh, to sacrifice yourself. You know, monogamy is not natural. Don't you know that? You know, I mean, these are not things you need to worry about. Well, we do not think that those things are saving us. But we, by faith, say we trust that God is in fact good and those things that are accusing you are ones that we confess our inability to fulfill fully from the heart and yet trust that God is good and his ways are right. That is how we uphold in part this law by faith. The two things that we uphold by faith is that it has done its work on us. You know, there are people, I'm sure, who tell you, you're being too hard on yourself. The hardest person to forgive is yourself. You know, you just got to start with forgiving yourself. Like, well, try that. It doesn't work. If it worked, we wouldn't have so many depressed and miserable, unforgiven people. Because you can only be forgiven by someone else who actually can do something about the weight that you're carrying. And that's what Jesus has come to do. But it's a confession of faith. 
You know, I, I feel guilty because I heard um, thou shalt not kill and I have hated this person in my heart and Lord, forgive me. Well, that's a faithful prayer. But it's similarly faithful to know that it has in fact been forgiven and then therefore there is a means of hope and redemption whereby the sins confessed are forgotten as far as the east is from the west. You see, we don't overthrow the law. We, by faith, say that it has done its work and now it no longer accuses us and perhaps we can see in God's design for our world something of his created goodness and pleasure. That's what we leave with at the end of Romans 3. Okay, I'm going to get you out of here. We're going to pray. But stay with us. Next week, uh, I've got to be up at the Trinity, board, uh, Trinity School for Ministry Board, so Kelly will be in capable hands with Kelly, uh, who will be going through Romans 4, all about Abraham. But Paul, suffice it to say, has thrown this out, and now he's going to pull back, and we're going to sort of meander more slowly through some of these great ideas over the next weeks as we continue to watch Um, the way that God's and his redemptive plan is unfolded for the sake of the world. So let's pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sought us and you have uh, drawn us out of darkness, Lord, that despite the state of sin into which we are born, that you have unstopped our ears and opened our eyes and that we know that that left to our own devices, we would run from you, and yet we find by the power of your Spirit, um, day by day, an increasing desire to to walk with you, to be with you, to uh, confess our need for you, Lord, and to boast in nothing but you and your cross. Lord, we ask that you would continue to strengthen us through the expositing and study of your word, that we would be given a greater confidence to proclaim boldly and with... with, um, with assuredness, uh, something of your saving grace to our family and friends and to a lost and hurting world for which you died. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, see you next... Well, I won't see you next week. I'll be in cold, cold Ambridge, Pennsylvania. So, uh, so see you in there following week.